Father, today we rejoice in that good news that you are the one who goes before us. You're the one who comes behind. You surround us with your power, with your love, with your grace. Lord, this morning we know that there's nothing that we should be afraid of because if you are for us, who can be against us? And yet we come into your presence and we confess our anxieties, uh, our fears, those things that keep us awake at night. And we bring them to you, Lord, asking that you would give us peace and strength and courage. Whether we're anxious about our health and life and death issues, about our family, our, our marriage, our kids, or about our finances, Lord, we know that you are the one that we can trust. So this morning we come and we simply ask that you would speak into our lives, that we would sense your, your presence and your power, and that we would leave here changed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 18. This is the fourth Gospel in the New Testament. So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible with you, Uh, Then grab one of these that looks just like this. They're in the pew all around you. Turn to page 1,151, and you will be in John 18 in the text we're going to be looking at today. And by the way, if you need a Bible, uh, you want to read and study God's Word, then feel free to take one of these with you when you leave. Now, if you want to go to the Swap Mart and sell it, no, that's not what it's for. But but if you're going to use it, then we want you to have it. It's a gift uh, to you. Hey, while uh, you're finding John 18, and and I know Pastor O.C. mentioned a whole bunch of things that are going on, let me mention one other uh, uh, event uh, that's happening right now, and that is, it's not really an event, but it's an opportunity for you to feed your soul and grow as a person, as a couple. Uh, We're uh, in the midst of our sign-ups for spring session life groups. Now, we believe that life change happens in the context of life groups, and so we want everyone to be in a life group. And, uh, and if you're not in a life group, then we want to encourage you to stop by the tables on your way out and sign up for one of the two session options that we have for the spring session. Now, it's a seven-week session, starts right after Easter, ends before school is out. Uh, and you can do a session where it, it is uh, a life group built around the, the sermon and what we've talked about and further study, and you get to, to discuss that and learn more uh, related to the topic. Or you can sign up for a married life group. People are going like, what is that for? Is that for people like whose, whose marriages need help? No, it's for anybody who's married who wants to have a better marriage. And uh, it's kind of video driven, and we've got some special groups that are just for this session that, uh, that are doing married life. And so if you want to be a part of one of those, stop by the table, check them out. Maybe you'll find a night that works for you, a group that you can join and let God bless you and teach you through that. So today we are continuing our series called Persons of Interest. We're looking at people in the Bible that are related to the the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and and the part they played in that, learning from their lives uh, some things that really make a difference in our lives. And today we're looking at the the life of the only Gentile who is a major character in the crucifixion account, a a man named Pontius Pilate. Uh, now, Pilate is, uh, is his name, and I'm going to tell you about the man, Pilate, before we dive into the text and, and learn some things uh, about him and the decisions he made. But first of all, Pilate was the Roman governor of uh, Judea, the, the area of that's now modern-day Israel, and Rome conquered the, the Jews in 63 B.C., and they ruled them militarily. They, they forced taxes from them, and they tried to keep the peace. And that was Pilate's job. Collect the taxes, keep the peace. And that was not an easy task because the Jews hated the Romans. They didn't want them there. They wanted to be their own nation, and, and they wanted to be free. And they believed that Messiah would be a political military figure who would lead them in rebellion against Rome and help them establish their own nation. Uh, So Pilate was a Roman governor of Judea, and Pilate knew that accusations against Jesus were politically motivated. Um, If you're not familiar with the story, the the religious leaders took Jesus and condemned him to death, but they couldn't execute him. So they took him to Pilate, the governor, because he had the power to execute. 
And, and, and when they brought Jesus to him, Pilate uh, knew that they were envious of Jesus. They were threatened by Jesus because crowds were flocking to Jesus. They were calling Jesus Messiah. And so he knew the charges were trumped up. He knew that at best they were insignificant. And in fact, he actually declared Jesus innocent and tried to release him. We also know from the text that Pilate was afraid. He was afraid. He was afraid of Jesus. His wife had a dream and she said, have nothing to do with this man because I suffered terribly in my dream because of him. And of course, when Pilate heard from the religious leaders that Jesus claimed to be the son of God, he didn't want to have anything to do with him because he thought, I don't want to mess with somebody who's God's son. But he was also afraid of the religious leaders because they threatened the peace of the land. And basically, since it was his job to keep the peace, they threatened his job. And so in the end, Pilate was more afraid of losing his job than he was of executing an innocent man. And then Pilate tried to absolve himself of guilt. Uh, if you're familiar with the story at all, uh, then what do you imagine Pilate doing whenever you think about him? Washing his hands. Washing his hands. Because when he handed Jesus over to be crucified... He washed his hands to symbolize that he was not uh, guilty. That he was innocent of this man's blood, is the way he put it. He tried to absolve himself of guilt while he was doing something that he was guilty of. Now, let me just share a tip with you. If you're about to do the wrong thing for the wrong reason, do not publicly declare yourself innocent. Okay? Because nobody believes you. And in fact, it might get recorded like for all of posterity for people to go, oh, look at him. He's being a hypocrite and a liar at the same time. In the end, uh, Pilate, the man, condemned an innocent man. He handed Jesus over to be crucified and he condemned to death the one guiltless, sinless man who's ever walked this earth. So how did Pilate arrive at this action? You know, we know that Jesus' death and resurrection was part of God's plan to redeem us all along. That, that Jesus died to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead so that we could have life forever. And, and that was God's plan. But God didn't make Pilate act this way. God didn't make Judas act this way. God didn't make uh, the high priest act this way. He, he looks into our lives. He knows us and he knows our character. God knows how we're going to act because he knows who we are. And so when he acted with Pilate, he knew how Pilate was going to respond to the situation. Uh, even though Pilate himself maybe didn't when he started. So we get a glimpse in the Gospel of John how Pilate was thinking. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us what Pilate did. But the Gospel of John actually records a conversation with Jesus. Pilate and Jesus are talking. And in this conversation, Pilate asks Jesus three questions that Jesus answers. Three great questions. And I want us today to look at Pilate's questions. And we need to answer them for ourselves. Because Pilate answered them all wrong. And it ended up him doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And so I want to ask these questions again. I want us to listen in on the dialogue. And then I want to challenge us to answer the questions correctly. Because that way we, we can do the right things for the right reasons. And God can bless our lives. So here we go. Pilate's questions. Question number one. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 33. It says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, if my kingdom were of this world, uh, excuse me, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Jesus says, yes, I'm a king. But my kingdom is different than what you think it is. My kingdom is beyond what you can imagine. My kingdom is beyond what you can conceive in terms of kingdoms. Because Jesus is the king and his kingdom is based on love and mercy, not power and domination. Rome ruled through power. 
I mean, they were all about suppression and military intervention and, and cruelty perfected. But Jesus' kingdom was different. And Pilate got the answer that he asked for. Are you a king? Yes. But Pilate ignored the answer. He's like, well, okay, but he didn't treat Jesus like royalty. He didn't suddenly give Jesus respect and honor as a king in his presence. Pilate ignored that fact and did not give Jesus the place he deserved in his life. Please make no mistake, Scripture is very clear that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That when everything is said and done and this world is finished, Jesus is the last man standing. There is no one else. All of his foes will be completely and ultimately defeated. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of that which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Which means it doesn't matter if you're for Jesus or against Jesus, at some point we're all going to recognize that Jesus is the King. So Jesus is the King. How are you going to respond? Are you going to ignore him like Pilate did? I mean, Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, yes. And Pilate went, okay, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, did he act any differently? He said, okay, so what? Are you just going to disregard the reality that Jesus is the king of kings? Are you going to ignore that fact and live your life in neutral? Kind of being a spiritual Switzerland. You know? I'm not going to take sides. I don't want to offend anybody. So you just kind of do your own thing and ignore him. Jesus is the king. Are you going to rebel against him? Are you going to live your life actively opposed to Jesus, his teachings, his values, his church, his kingdom? Because there are those who are living in opposition to Jesus right now. You think, well, this is a church. Would anybody here be opposed to Jesus? Well, I don't know. Maybe someone tricked you into coming. Could be. But right now, there are people in our culture who are opposed to Jesus and his values and his people and his kingdom. They, they want that to be a private thing. They don't want you to bring that into the public square. They don't want you to talk about it out loud. They don't want you to represent Christ and his values in any way, shape, or form uh, openly. And, and, and so there are those in our society, in our culture, who are opposed to Jesus and his values and his kingdom. And there are, po- there are people in our world that are opposed to Jesus and his values and his kingdom. We know this and we see it most clearly uh, modeled by the Islamic terrorists who last month took 21 Egyptian Christians and cut their heads off because they were Christians. There are people who are living opposed to Jesus as king. Or will you submit to Jesus' kingship And serve him with your life. Will you identify yourself as belonging to Jesus? Will you live his values and advance his mission? You see, Jesus is the king. How are you going to respond? There's a lot of people who with their words claim allegiance to Jesus. But with their lives they live like Switzerland. That's why Jesus asked this question. Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Jesus is the king. What's your response to him? Second question. Pilate asks, what is the truth? What is truth? Continue the conversation. Verse 37, John chapter 18. Then Pilate said to Jesus, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now Jesus answered the question about as bluntly as you can. He goes, hey, look, everyone who's of the truth listens to me. They listen to Jesus. And this is not the first time that Jesus makes bold claims about truth. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to God except through me. 
Jesus says, look, if you want truth, then I'm truth. You got to know me to know truth. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32, Jesus said, If you live in my words, if you abide in my words, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So how do you know the truth? You you know it because you listen and live to uh, the words of Christ. Jesus said, whoever's of the truth listens to my voice, listens to me. So what is truth? Who or what determines truth for you? What is your source of truth in your life? Uh, Who do you believe over all else? You see, Pilate uh, believed and trusted himself. I mean, he asked Jesus the question after Jesus told him, hey, if you're of the truth, you listen to me. And Pilate's like, yeah, what's truth? I don't care. I'm going to believe myself. I'm going to do what I want. It doesn't matter what you say. Now, this is a crucial question that in large part determines how you're going to live your life. And it's a question that, that I really hope and pray that you, you take with you and you struggle with all week long. Because how you determine truth determines how you're going to live your life. What is truth? There's, now, you know, I, I told you we got questions and Pilate failed the test. And, and so if this was a test, this would be a multiple choice kind of answer. Because there's only three options Three ways that you can answer the question of how you or I determine truth for our lives. Option one is is that we follow a teacher or a guru or a philosophy or a religion that says here is what truth is and here is how we're going to live. So you decide that Karl Marx and communism is your way. Or you decide that you're going to follow Gandhi and pacifism and that's that's your truth. Or maybe you decide that everything that Oprah says is true, and so you're going to be a follower of Oprahism. <laughs> See, and we laugh about stuff like that, but there are a lot of people who say, well, Oprah said it, so I believe it. You know, it doesn't matter if it's Dr. Phil or Hinduism or Islam or Garfield the cat. You can pick whoever you want and say, this is the person who des- determines truth for me. That's one of the options that we have. Second option for determining truth is you. You decide your truth. Like one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite movies, I know my truth. And, and we can laugh at that, but isn't that how a lot of us live? Where nowadays people are pretty much saying, hey, uh, I've got my truth and you got your truth and I'm deciding for me what's true and you decide for you what's truth. And, and we'll just live like it doesn't matter, like there really isn't an objective truth. I'll decide the answers for me that work, you decide for you. And so I'll get, and, and the, the, guess what, you can decide that, just admit that that's what you're doing. That you've decided that you're the final arbiter of truth in your life. What you're saying is, I know more than anybody else. I know more than God. And I'm going to decide for me. And by the way, pride tempts us to do this all the time. Pride wants to tell us, hey, you know, you're right. Right? Because don't most of us kind of live our lives thinking that we're right? Come on, are you always right? Am I the only one in this room who you know, goes into an argument believing that my position is correct and everybody else is wrong? Am I the only one who sits around with friends thinking, hey, we, if we ran the world, it would be a lot better place than it is right now, right? We can fix all these problems if they just listen to us because we know what's true. So you can follow a guru, a teacher, a philosophy. You can follow you or you can decide that Jesus is truth. After all, he claimed to be the personification of truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But if you believe that Jesus is truth, then that means that you submit your knowledge and your opinions to his word. If you abide in my words, then you are truly my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. It means that the Bible influences your life, your values, your opinions, your actions, your behaviors. It means that we submit to the truth of God's word at every point in our life. And by the way, as a church, we've already decided to do that because our first essential doctrine is this. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. 
That's our decision to say, hey, Jesus is truth, and we're going to practice that. And so we study the Bible to learn about ourselves, that we're sinners, that we're hopeless, that left to our own devices, we will be self-destructive people, and that God has rescued us through Jesus Christ in his sacrifice on the cross, paid the debt for our sin, and that if we trust Jesus, we have life eternal. And if we don't trust Jesus, then he's going to leave us to live forever in our destruction and pain. So we study the Bible, God's word to learn the truth about God, that God is king, that he is holy and just and righteous and pure and loving and kind and merciful, that he is savior and redeemer and friend. We study the Bible to learn about the world, (laughs) that it's messed up. You already knew that, right? That's one thing you don't have to study the Bible to figure out. But we study the Bible to learn why it's messed up. And what God's going to do about that. What he's done in Jesus Christ. And how in the end, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you win. You can't lose. That's why we don't have to panic. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Whom shall we fear? We study God's word and learn the truth about relationships. That we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. That we're to be kind and compassionate, forgiving one another. That we're to serve one another and care for one another. You see, if we live that way, it'll change our lives. So if you agree with Jesus that he's the truth, then your entire life is built on the authority of Scripture. So how do you answer the question, what is truth? Then Pilate's third question. Do you not know that I have authority? Flip a page to chapter 19. We're going to pick up the story in verse 9. What happens is that Pilate goes out to the religious leaders and tells them that Jesus is innocent. He uh, punishes Jesus. He has him whipped brutally. Brings him out. Says, you know, is this good enough? And the people say, no, you got to crucify him. He claimed to be the son of God. He's an enemy of Caesar. you got to crucify him. And then Pilate comes back in and he's, and he's distressed. And we pick up the story in verse 9. In fact, he's afraid. And he says, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Pause right there. Pilate is upset with Jesus. He is irritated at Jesus because... Because Pilate knows he's losing the day. The chief priests are going to get what they want. And Pilate doesn't think they deserve it. and And he wants to protect Jesus. So he says, Jesus, give me something. Work with me here. Come on. I'm trying to save you. Don't you get that? I'm trying to rescue you. Hey, don't you love the irony in that? Come on. You know, tell me where you're from. Tell me this stuff. Help me out here. Don't you understand? This is what he says. Don't you understand who I am? Don't you understand how important I am? Don't you understand I have the power of Rome? I have the power of the soldiers. I have the power to crucify you or to release you. You need to trust me. Now, I just got to observe this fact that a lot of times we kind of come to God the same way that Pilate did. Don't we? Things aren't working out the way that we want them to. And we kind of come to Jesus and we go, hey, Jesus, work with me here. Don't you know who I am? I'm serving you. I'm going to church. I'm giving money. Uh, I'm doing good things. I helped out with the car show yesterday. Come on, I'm trying to do something for you. I, I'm, I'm trying to bless your kingdom, and you're not. You, I need you to heal this. I need you to fix that. I need you to clean up my messes. Come on. By the way, um, Jesus wasn't impressed with Pilate, and Jesus isn't impressed with you. He's not. He knows us and he loves us. But uh, we kind of get a little full of ourselves at times. And, well, listen to how he responds to Pilate. Remember, Pilate's going off. He's kind of crazy. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. 
<laughs> That's a nice consolation prize, isn't it? Hey, you're less guilty than the chief priest, but you're still guilty. Pilate wants Jesus to trust in his power, and Jesus responds, I'll trust my Father who gave you your power. I'm going to trust my Father to take care of me, not you. So today, who are you trusting to take care of you? Who are you trusting to protect you, to provide for you, to help you in your hour of need? Are you relying on yourself, on your abilities, on your skills, on on your strength and your wisdom? Are you relying on your bank accounts or your investments or your weapons? Or maybe you're relying on your friends or your family, maybe your spouse. Maybe you're relying on the government. Or lawyers or a fraternal organization to advocate for you? Or are you trusting in the God that you cannot see? Who offers you eternal life, who paid for your sins, and who promised to never leave you or forsake you? Who are you trusting in? Now I know right now the easy answer is, I'm trusting in God. Because we're in church. And that's the, good, that's the right answer, isn't it? Hey, you're, some of you are sitting there going, hey, if this is a test, I got this one right. <laughs> I can write down trusting in God, turn it in, and pass. It is so easy to say the right answer, isn't it? We trust in God. We're trusting in Jesus. It's, it's all good. But are we willing to rely on God even when we're about to get crucified? Because that's what Jesus did. He knew the pain that was ahead of him, and Pilate was offering him a way out of it. And Jesus said, now I'll trust the Father, even if I get crucified. See, most of us want God to do it our way. We want God to ride in and rescue us from the pain before it happens. We want him to heal us, you know, right before we get sick. We want him to, to fix our messes, you know, so that we don't have to pay the consequences. And when he doesn't, do we still trust him? Let me be really direct. If we're not trusting God in our relationships and our families, we're not going to trust him with our lives. And if we're not trusting God in our business, in our career, in our work, we're not going to trust him with our lives. If we're not trusting God with our money, are we really going to trust him with our lives? Who are you trusting to take care of you? Pilate was face to face with Jesus. He asked him great questions. And Pilate answered them all wrong. Today you're face to face with the living God. We ask the questions. How are you going to answer them? Are you going to choose to trust God? Listen to the voice of Jesus, the voice of truth. And submit to him as king? Or are you going to go on living life your way? Let's pray. Father, we confess that so often we live life our way. We trust ourselves. We consider our own wisdom. We don't want to submit to anybody. And so we offer up that confession knowing that your grace and mercy are abundant, that that you're willing to forgive us and love us and continue walking with us on this journey. So Lord, today, let us hear your voice. Each and every one of us in this room, let let us have the courage that we need to follow you, to submit to you, to listen to your truth and not our opinion, and to trust you even when we don't see how you're going to rescue us. Because we can't do it without you. We need you more than anything else in this world. We surrender ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.